So today we will be talking about CQ. So you know what IQ is, today we will talk about CQ. And so we will do a couple of things here to begin with. Um, uh, so CQ is cultural intelligence. And let me share my screen here, so just one second. Um, and we will talk about how cultural intelligence, first what it is, and then equally importantly, what it is not, but then also how it's been measured, how it's been conceptualized, uh, what are the problems with the current way to measure cross-cultural competencies? And then finally, what does it mean and what does it predict? So it's a good construct, good concept, but does it really explain anything? Does it really predict anything? And so what I would like to do is um, I would like to start, uh, sorry, um, I would like to start with um, asking you to take a um, IQ test and then cultural intelligence test. And so what I'll do here is for the IQ test, I will just preview it for you on my screen. But for the cultural intelligence test, I will invite you, um, I'll give you the link and you can literally take it on your computer or we can do it together just to, to give you a sense of what those tests look like. But also if you wanna know sort of what your score is. And so once we've taken both tests, what, once we've taken, uh, sorry, um, I took the, um, once we, we've taken both tests an IQ test and a CQ test, my question will be, what is the difference? In a sense, how do the two constructs are measured? How are they different? And then second, do you see any problems with how IQ versus CQ is measured? And so this is an IQ test. That's the one that we use in Xculture. So let me just um, one second here, uh, open the test. And so you probably have taken IQ tests before. So you sort of probably know what they look like. And just to remind you, we will do it together. So start the test. So um, let's go ahead here. And uh, don't be embarrassed if you don't know the answers. Um, uh, it's, it's not supposed to be too easy, but um, I'm not sure why my screen is still so slow, but yeah, anyway. So here is the test. And uh, let me just scale it so that you can see the whole thing, oops. And uh, that's the test. So what's the correct answer? Let's see if you can answer it. So just um, don't be shy, unmute your microphone and tell me what you think the answer is. I'll show you a few of those questions. Again, there are, it's not for a, you know, not for a grade, it's just to give you a sense of what the tests look like. So what would be the answer? Anyone? You can put it in the comments or you can, um, uh, you can put it in the, uh, just unmute your microphone and just tell me. Anyone? I think it's F. So you think it's F, anyone else? Yeah, I think it's F2. Yeah, it is F. Very good, very good. How about this one? So this is very easy. So again, I'm sure you'll know the answer. B. B, it is B. You got it right again. So I'll skip a few more. So here you kind of have sort of pattern matching, right? So like for this one, you probably will know the answer too. So what would be the answer for this one? Relatively easy. E. Uh, which one? E. E. Probably. Oh, e. Although, again, this one's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, E seems to be, well, could it oh, be no. F or could it be matching yeah. with you? At A. So let's, let's see. So they have. Uh, Not sure. So which one do you, did you guys choose? It seems to me that all of them have dot, empty, big dot, empty. So I guess it seems like this would be probably E, I'm guessing, right? Could it be? So, well, anyway, that, that's how it would work. And then let me show you a couple others that are a little bit more difficult. So the pattern matching is relatively easy. But then when we get to, for example, something like this, can you, can you answer this one? So what do we have here? Yeah, that's a, a relatively easy one. Can you get it guys? I'll give you a hint. Minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. 
minus six minus seven. So the answer would be what? B. It would be B, so it's two, right? So you got the idea and let me see if there is any other type of question. So these are still kind of more pattern matching. Um, and I think there, there are a few questions here that are a little different. Like for example, this one, which one of the five is least like the, the other four? Anyone? I hope you can read it here. Snake. Yeah, snake. So all of them are mammals. The snake is a reptile. Which number should come next in the sequence? So that, that looks to me like Fibonacci numbers, right? So what's the number in the sequence? 21. 21, right. How about this one? Which one of the five choices makes the best comparison? So you have peach to cheap, I guess, right? Or chap. So what would be the, the one for 46 to 51? So obviously that's kind of spelled backwards. So this would be this one, right? And so that's basically how the IQ tests are designed. They deliberately keep it sort of culture free. When you look at some old um, IQ tests, some of them were, how should I put it? Like for example, the question would be name three known European composers or, or maybe Austrian composers. And so it's a good question, but uh, depending on where you come from, you may know that answer or you may not know that answer because if you happen to be from Austria, you probably will know the Austrian composers. Or if you happen to come from a family where music is part of the sort of you know, general discussions, you know the answer. But if your family never talks about European music, it doesn't mean that you're not smart. It's just something that is not relevant to your context. Or for example, there were questions about, um, for example, you know, um, rules of the game like baseball or, or maybe football. So there would be some sort of a scenario and then you have to answer you know, who's winning. Again, if you happen to be from the United States and you play baseball, then it's easy for you to answer it. But if you are from Europe, you don't know the baseball rules. So for you, it would be more difficult to answer. Or maybe a question about speed and distance and weights. And again, maybe it's in miles versus kilometers versus you know, pounds and kilograms. Again, depending on which country you come from, you may, not, may or may not know the answer. So that makes it kind of more difficult. So now the questions tend to be more neutral. Like for example, you know, this one here, if all bloops are raises and all raises are lazies, all bloops are definitely lazies. True or false? So here you have this kind of Venn diagram type of deal. So all bloops are raises. So you have kind of big circle and bloops are within that big circle. And raises are lazies. So again, then bloops are definitely lazies. True or false? So uh, again, you would need to sort of draw those kind of circles and see how they overlap to answer the question. So, but all of these are made up. So it doesn't mean that loops are something specific. So just something, you know, made up. So, but this is what an IQ test looks like. Now, let's do a test that is a CQ, cultural intelligence. And so what I'll do here is in the comments, so this will be the most popular cultural intelligence test developed by Sue Ann et al and colleagues. <clears throat> and so that's the one that is by far the most popular. I actually wrote a couple of papers that review cultural intelligence measurement. And it looks like this one literally accounts for like 95% of all of the tests. And so let me see here, yes, um, what I'll do here, I'll send you the link. Oops, uh, let me just see if I can get you that link in the comments. And so this way uh, you will be able, if you want, um, let me stop sharing, you will be able to take it in your own or on your own computer. But um, so if you wanna go ahead, but I'll also show you what it looks like on my screen. And so this way we can sort of analyze and get a sense of what a CQ test looks like. So maybe it's better just in the interest of time, let's take a look at my screen. And then um, when you if you wanna take it at home, you can take it at home uh, later on. But um, this is what the CQ test looks like, cultural intelligence test. Again, you would enter your information here and then you have a set of 21 statements, if I remember correctly. And you need to show indicate your level of agreement with these statements. And so let's try to do it together just out of curiosity, you know, um, uh, without scoring the test. So for example, statement one, I'm conscious of the cultural knowledge I use when interacting with people with different cultural backgrounds. So what would you put here? Do you agree, disagree, neutral? 
um, just give me the answer. So I will not be like, for example, you know, let's say Thad, what would you give to that statement? Do you agree that, that you're- would probably be the, the dot between neutral and agree, the fourth. So, okay, fourth four, okay. Point. How about Olivia, what would you give to this answer? I would give um, the first, agree for the first. Agree. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, and so on. How about this one, um, Amber? I adjust my cultural knowledge as I interact with people from cultures that is unfamiliar to me. I would give the far right, agree. Agree, so you adjust as you interact. Tessa, I'm conscious of cultural knowledge I apply to cross-cultural interactions. Yeah, I'm sorry, I agree, strongly agree. Mm -hmm. Let's do a couple more. I, in fact, let's do the whole thing because this is the foundation. Almost all the other instruments have very similar structure, very similar set of questions. So I check the accuracy of my cultural knowledge as I interact with people from different cultures. What would you give guys? Do you check the accuracy of cultural knowledge as you interact with people from different cultures? Yeah, I agree. I know the legal and economic systems of other cultures. Do you guys know the legal and economic systems of other cultures? I would be neutral on that one, I think. All right, let's be a neutral. little more disagree. Yeah. Or even disagree. Uh, I know the rules, vocabulary, grammar of other languages. Anyone? Mm -hmm. So something like this, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I know the cultural values and religious beliefs of other cultures. Do you know the cultural values and beliefs and religious beliefs of other cultures? Maybe like neutrally. Neutral, neutral, yeah. I know the marriage systems of other cultures. Yes, no? I, no. Disagree. Okay. Great. So, because I know some people were nodding, some people were shaking their heads. Oh. <laughs> I know the arts and crafts of other cultures. You are very modest, guys, in your answers, which is, I guess, good. <laughs> so, do you know the, the, the arts and crafts of other cultures? How are we supposed to, like, so I know the arts and crafts of some cultures, like the ones where I've traveled or the ones where I've ah. spent more time, but not all of them, right? Well, so... Well, Hold that thought, Amber. We'll get to that in a minute. So let's now try okay. to answer. You know, let's say you're applying for a job and the job requires you to frequently interact with people from other cultures. And the employer read my paper that shows that cultural intelligence predicts your ability to do it. And they decided right. to include it in the selection tests so that, uh, you know, they can select the best person for the job. And maybe you are not sure how to answer this question, but that's what you see. So the interview these days are all online and they give you the test. And then they will look at that. And so you need to come up with the answer. What would you give? I would probably go not quite all the way to agree, but the one next to it. Next to it. All right. I know the rules for expressing nonverbal behaviors in other cultures. That's hard. So, so here somewhere or neutral? Yeah. Now, an easy question. So I enjoy interacting with people from different cultures. Do you or do you agree. not? Agree. Yeah, agree. <laughs> I'm confident that I can socialize with locals in a culture that is unfamiliar to me. I would agree. I agree. All right. I am sure I can deal with the stresses of adjusting to a culture that is new to me. I agree. agree? I agree to that, yeah. I enjoy living in cultures that are unfamiliar to me. I yep. agree. Mm -hmm. I'm confident that I can get accustomed to the shopping conditions in different cultures. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I charge my, uh, I change my verbal behavior such as accent or tone when I, uh, when a cross-cultural interaction requires it. So do you yeah. change your accent and tone or not when the situation requires it? Yeah, I agree. Okay. I, use I would say advice oh, yeah. on that one. I would say I agree, but um, only if I knew what the rules of the game <laughs> That's were. That's a good one too. Yes. So who knows what you know what that accent like? If you can speak in that accent or tone, right? I use pause and silence differently to suit different cross-cultural situations. Do you change your the way you use pa you know pauses and silence periods? I would yeah, give the we, same answer I just gave if I knew what the cultures were, <laughs> maybe. All right. yeah. I would say somewhat agree on that one. 
On that one, by the way, an interesting relevant story um, in the 80s, uh, when Japan opened up to the Western world, um, a lot of companies were doing business in, in Japan, obviously. And so for the American companies, uh, one of the um, sort of challenges or uh, uncomfortable situations was that um, in Japan, um, often you have uh, prolonged periods of silence. So the culture is such that they first, they never interrupt, uh, but, but, you know, like when they talk, they don't interrupt each other but also they would literally have a few minutes of silence, uh, presumably to give the, you know, the conversation partner a chance to reflect on what's been said. And so those periods of silence are uh, essentially a way to express both respect, but also respect for the topic. Like in the United States, when people talk, if you wanna show that you sort of, you know, you are in agreement, you, you respect the, you know, the, the, the partner in the conversation, you, you kind of, you pay attention, you would kind of nod as they talk, or maybe you would say, oh, mm, yeah, okay, yeah, right, right. So there, they just, you know, silence. And so for Americans, you know, like 10 seconds of silence, let's, let's do 10 seconds of silence. No. So even 10 seconds is kind of painful, right? So like, you know, like <laughs> what's going on? Why do we all, and there sometimes it would be like five minutes. And so Americans find that like, why everybody, you know, like what do they do? And so Americans frequently felt compelled to say something. I mean, like you're in a meeting, why would you just sit and watch, you know, look at each other? And so to Americans, the Japanese looked strange and sometimes even sort of bizarre, like everybody just sits and, you know, not talks. And then uh, to the Japanese, Americans looked like, you know, rude and disrespectful and maybe not caring about the topic because they always want to talk. And so obviously, you know, if you know, you would then use the pause and silence appropriately. But, you know, who would in the United States think that it's acceptable to just, you know, have like two minutes of silence. So that's an interesting one. But anyway, I vary the rate of my speaking when a cross-cultural situation requires it. Do you? Yes. All right. I change my nonverbal behavior when a cross-cultural situation requires it, like maybe of gestures and uh, expressions. Do you change it? Yeah, because some yeah. things yep. are really interested in some cultures that we, we don't know. Like a thumbs up in some parts of Europe is not the same thing. Exactly. As it is. Yeah, it's more like a middle finger. Or okay, that's a, not a very good symbol in many cultures, right? So um, absolutely. I alter my fa facial expressions when a cross-cultural interaction requires it. Do you? Yes. Okay, all right. So. Those are your answers. Let's come to them a little bit later. So um, let me go back to my slides here now. And um, so where's my slides? Uh, just a second. Uh, screen over screen. And uh, so the question I have for you is, do you see any difference between the way the CQ instrument is designed and the IQ instrument is designed in terms of the approach? What would be sort of the big, the big fundamental difference in how they approach the whole enterprise? The CQ one is very much reflective on yourself. So how you do things, how you feel about your abilities, whereas the IQ one seems to just be um, less subjective, I guess. Exactly, exactly. That's one of the components. And so we'll talk today a lot about those kinds of things. So here are some of the things that bother me, for example. Uh, in an IQ test, like what we looked, you know, you have a question that has a right and a wrong answer. Like which of the number, which number comes next in the series, you either know it or you don't. So in this case, we see that it's plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. So the next one would be plus 621. And you either know it or you don't. And when you know it, you know it. When you don't know it, you usually know that you don't know. Now in the CQ test, the one that I just showed you, it would be sort of self-assessment, self-report, as they call it. So self-assessed report. So agree, disagree. And so the challenge is here that, you know, to simplify it, the IQ test is two plus two equals, and you either know that it's four or you don't. But the CQ test would be more like, you know, like if it were the, if IQ tests use the same approach as CQ, instead of asking you what is two plus two, they would say, I know the answer to the question two plus two. And then you choose what the answer would be. And then you would say to this one, probably strongly agree. But then again, uh, you know, it would be self-assessed and uh, self-reported. And so do you see the problem with the self-assessment and self-report? 
Yeah. The biggest problem I see, for example, is that one, uh, what uh, Amber already pointed out, that sometimes you don't even know what to say. Like, for example, if you ask me to answer the question, I know the legal environment, economic and uh, legal and economic systems of other cultures. I really don't know what to say. Like, I really don't know. I can give myself a five because I probably know more than most people. But then I know how little I know. I mean, I've been to only, you know, I don't know how many countries, maybe 30, 40 countries. And I don't know much about all of those countries anyway. So I would think that I don't know much. So maybe I would give agree or maybe even somewhat agree or maybe even disagree. Because again, like Amber said, you know, are we talking about all countries or other countries or at least one country? I mean, I know that there are what 187 countries on the planet legally recognized by, by the United Nations. And I probably know about legal and economic systems, maybe only of half of them. So I cannot say that I know the legal and economic systems of other cultures. So I can give myself literally anything from one to five, you know, in good faith, not being, you know, a cheater. But then second, again, in that example that I gave Amber, so Amber, imagine that that's your job interview and that, you know, getting or not getting job depends on how you answer these questions. Well, why not give myself a five on every dimension, right? So, I mean, why? Maybe I'll give a couple of four just so it doesn't look like I'm cheating here. But I mean, I can easily give myself, and it's easy to know what the employer wants to hear. I mean, it's not like these are some, you know, personality questions where you're not sure what they're looking for here. They probably want me to know uh, legal and economic systems of, of other cultures. So five is probably a more favorable answer and boom. So here I got the perfect score. So that's another challenge, obviously. And so for self-assessment, even when I'm honest, it's still difficult. But for assessment, for promotion, for jobs, for bonuses, for assignments overseas, they're very open to cheating and dishonesty. So, you know, that's a problematic. So, but anyway, this, is th this is Thad, I've got a quick question. Yes. And do you think it would be different also if, well, I know it would be different if I'm assessing myself versus if you knew me well and we were coworkers and doing a 360 assessment and you would assess me differently then I would assess myself. For instance, I may think I know your culture in the Ukraine well, but you say he doesn't know a thing about the Ukraine based on the way I act. Not only this is an excellent question, like right on exactly, but I actually have the precise answer. So in Exculture, what we do, we have three assessments. So we have self-assessment where students take this same very test. Then we have other assessment where we ask people to assess others on a specifically on that same test. And then we also have the generic one. So, you know, just give the definition without going into the specific questions. And yes, the correlation is not that high among those three things. So, but then with other assessment, one of the challenges we'll also see is that it sometimes seems to be not so much assessment of CQ, but more how much I like you. Because we see the correlation is not, so the correlation is higher with peer evaluations on friendliness than with self assessment on CQ. So it almost seems like if I like you, I'll give you high grades on everything, either because I want to help you or just because, well, that is a, such a nice, nice guy. He must be interested in, you know, working with people from Ukraine. He must know a lot about that. So again, it becomes kind of difficult. You know, sometimes you can't even know for yourself. And now imagine I have to decide if you know about other cultures, how much, you know, like that becomes even more challenging. So a very, very tricky proposition here. So, um, Let's talk, so we'll get to the management me measurement in a second. So let's talk a little bit about what CQ is. So if you had to define cultural intelligence or cross-cultural competencies, as they're sometimes called. In fact, there are several different names. There is also global competencies. Um, one of the papers I'll be talking about will literally have a whole section on the definitions and then terminology. And so there are like a dozen terms that are often used interchangeably. But if you had to give a definition to, uh, you know, of CQ, cultural intelligence, how would you define it? It's kind of, you know, like everybody sort of knows what it is, but again, how do you precisely define it? Like your ability to adapt to different cultures quickly or appropriately? That's actually very close. So most of the definitions literally say CQ is what makes us effective in cross-cultural settings. And sometimes the definition is CQ is a combination of attitudes, knowledge, and skills that makes us effective in cross-cultural settings. But the problem I have with this is the question is so, but what, what makes us effective in settings? So we know that, let's say we know that CQ makes us effective, but what, what is it? Like why, why some people are more effective? And so uh, here are some of the kind of provocative questions. 
So for example, knowledge of foreign languages, would it make you more effective in a different you know, cross-cultural setting? Probably it would. So is then secured the knowledge of languages? Or for example, knowledge of geography, protocols, traditions, legal systems, political systems, that helps us to adjust to new environments like Amber said. But so would the knowledge of geography and traditions and protocols be cultural intelligence? I don't know, maybe a component of it. How about awareness of cultural differences? You know, are you aware that your culture is different from other cultures? Or do you believe that all cultures are fun fundamentally the same? But then again, recognizing those differences, does it make you culturally intelligent? Or maybe vice versa, maybe, you know, the more differences you see, maybe the less likely you will be to adapt. If you think that everybody is ultimately the same, maybe it actually helps you. So I don't know. Uh, attitudes like motivation to work with people from other cultures or maybe attitudes towards people from other cultures. Again, so is that cultural intelligence or is something else? Behaviors. We talked about things like, um, uh, you know, I change my uh, nonverbal behavior, I change the way I talk. So would that be cultural intelligence or is it simply a manifestation of cultural intelligence or maybe it's just some sort of cheating. So you sort of kind of change your behavior just because you, you know, you think that people will like it. Or maybe it's some sort of like street smarts, like you kind of, you know how to get on the streets of, I don't know, Tehran or, or, or Munich or, or London. So does that make you culturally intelligent or, or something else, you know, experience? And, and I don't know, that's a very good question. And you, is it all of those or is it one of those or are they all correlated? Like for example, what is IQ? Can you define IQ? I'll be making references just to make, sort of to give you a good point of reference when thinking about CQ. Like how would you define IQ? Isn't it your intellectual capacity? So your but, ability but what is intellectual capacity? Yes, it is, but what makes you, you know, intellectually advanced? Your and ability. That, yeah, go ahead, Tessa interpret information and to draw conclusions based on the information possibly but so one of the big challenges of measuring iq is do we believe that there are different independent components of iq or do we believe that iq intelligence is some sort of a kind of global trend or trait and then if you're smart in one thing you're smart in another thing and so there are two different theories. And so there is literally one that is called uh, general cognitive ability. So it's like a letter G. So IQ is one of the indices and sometimes uh, another type to refer to it or another theory gives you a G index. And the G index gives you kind of your general cognitive ability. And so the two are very different because in the traditional IQ tests, you would be measured on things like, for example, memory. So can you memorize things? And then, for example, spatial orientation, when you have all those different, you know, cubes and uh, squares and you're trying to predict the pattern, you know, based on the spatial kind of geometry type of deal. But then there would be also, um, you know, number sequences. In this case, it's more kind of algebra or recognizing the patterns. But it could also be like, for example, um, uh, you know, some logical uh, problems. And so the G theory, the global, uh, the general cognitive ability theory, sort of assumes that if you are smart, if you have kind of high processing power in your brain, you can be good or you have to be good on all of those. So if you are good with pattern recognition, you probably will be good with memory. You probably will be good with uh, uh, spatial orientation. You probably will be good with verbal, whatever that is. But then other models say, no, you can be really good at spatial orientation, but really bad with memory or you can be really good with, you know, in your verbal abilities, but very bad in terms of logic. And so same thing with CQ. So if you are, you know, interested with uh, in, uh, interacting with people from other cultures, does it mean that you also will adapt to those situations and change your behavior and, and, and nonverbal behaviors, you know, patterns? Uh, or does it mean necessarily that you also know about traditions and geography and protocols of those countries uh, and so on and so on? Can somebody be culturally intelligent without knowing foreign languages? Or if I'm but, highly motivated, does it mean that I'm also knowledgeable or, or not necessarily? Yes, that, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, the, back, back to the, a comment, you always hear, uh, we've all known people that are extremely intelligent, very high to IQ, being a genius, but we always make comments, they have no common sense. You know, they just can't. Yep. sometimes rationalize things real well or do things just that you would think they would know how to do because they're extremely smart from an IQ point of view. Does yep. that, how does that relate to 
um, CQ versus IQ, you know, is that cultural or? That's a very, very good point. In fact, talking about IQ, I've, I've spent quite some time studying how they measure IQ. Um, I've developed um, one, co-developed and one developed on my own, um, two instruments for cultural intelligence. And as I was working on that, I wanted to know how other intelligences are measured. So I spent a lot of time, read a bunch of books on IQ measurement. And that is a problem. Like, like for example, when you look at the correlation between IQ and sort of success in life, yes, there is a positive correlation. But for example, when you look at people with extremely high IQ, in many cases, they're not as successful as you would expect. So there was this one guy in the 80s who had IQ like of 230, something like, like outrageously high number. And so he didn't really amount to much other than going from one talk show to another and showing that he can multiply like 10 digit numbers, you know, in his head. You know, like he never built a business. He never, apparently he even had like, you know, problems with family, like didn't really, you know, like what would define success in life. So he wasn't very happy either. It's not like that's what he chose. And vice versa, we sometimes see people like, for example, Richard Branson, uh, who self-acclaimed um, uh, dyslexic. So, you know, in his book, The Virgin Way, he talks a lot about how he has difficulties reading. He never succeeded at school, but now he is one of the richest people on the planet. You know, he has Virgin Galactic, Virgin um, uh, Mobile, Virgin um, Airlines, which apparently now went bankrupt. But anyway, a guy is very successful, very popular, very, you know, so he doesn't really have the IQ that we would, you know, expect from a person, you know, like he wouldn't be able to match those patterns and numbers but very successful otherwise. So does it mean that he's dumb, just lucky, or does it mean that maybe IQ is something else, you know, not memorizing the sequence of numbers? So same thing with CQ, that the truth is that we don't know. You know, there are different models and we'll talk about them today, you know, what constitutes CQ, but uh, is it all that there is to CQ? Is there more? And is it even CQ or is it something else? Like for example, the N at all model that we looked at, um, um, so the, the dimensions there, I'm not sure if you kind of spotted them. One is what they call motivational CQ. And that's the one that measures your interest with in, in interacting with other people. In fact, let me do here something. So what I'll, I should have added a slide on that. So what I'll do here is right after the test, I will type up the, the dimensions here. So um, CQ dimensions, and this is the one from N at all, but it's basically the foundation of all of them. So motivational CQ, so that's how much interest you have with, uh, in interacting with people from other cultures. Then they have what they call um, cogn uh, sorry, um, behavioral CQ. That's the one where you change your behavior, your speaking pattern, depending on um, you know, um, uh, the situation. Then they have what they call cognitive CQ. And the cognitive, that was the one, you know, I know about cultures of other countries. I know about political systems, economic systems. So that's the knowledge about the cultures. And then they have metacognitive. Metacognitive, that's you monitoring your knowledge. So the question that we had there, for example, um, I constantly monitor, you know, like I'm conscious of cultural knowledge I use when interacting with people from other cultures, or I adjust my cultural knowledge as I interact. So basically how you manage your knowledge. And so they thought that this is, this is what CQ is. So your motivation, your behavior adjustment, your knowledge, and then your knowledge and management of your knowledge. And so that's what they said. I mean, is it enough? I'm not sure. Other models would have dimensions such as, for example, um, uh, awareness. Are you aware that there is a difference between different cultures? Uh, or for example, there would be what some people call denial and acceptance. You know, do you accept that we are different and we have to be treated differently. And again, uh, so some people or some models believe that the more you accept the differences, the better. So sort of, you know, not only awareness, but also acceptance. So is it good enough or not? Well, that's a good question, but you know, uh, that's what we've done. And so when it comes to measurement, one of the things that I added to your, catalog, um, to your reading collection is the catalog of instruments for measuring CQ. So again, let me go to the readings here. I think this is something I didn't add from the very beginning, so, but it is now in the collection. So if you downloaded it early, you may not see this one. But just like I've been compiling a, instruments for measuring culture and then acculturation, uh, so too I've created an instrument or catalog of instruments for measuring cultural intelligence. And if I remember correctly, it's not numbered, but there are 56 that I was able to find. And so just to show you what they look like, uh, and there are different approaches here, so this is an instrument by Adair, Bakken, and Chen. So they measure your ability to, measure, to manage emotions, meanings, emotions of others, expression of style, conflict and tension, 
uh, disagreement and persuasion. Oh, and there is also relationship context, whatever that is. And so this one has what about like 25 or so items. Oh, there are actually more here. So this one's very long. So that, that's the same one. Then uh, along, so that, that's the DCAQ that I co-developed. So uh, here we have motivational, very similar to um, and at all the one that we had there. Adaptive communicative behavior. So it's similar to the behavioral that they have. Then we also had learning. It's kind of similar to metacognitive. And then what we did differently for the knowledge, we actually had real questions that you either know the answer or you don't. Like, let me show you one here. For example, in the US, people greet each other often uh, up. In the US, people greet each other formally in continuous business relationships using their titles and surnames. Is it true or false? So when people work together for, a, for an extended period of time, they greet each other formally using, I guess, first and last name or mister. Probably false, oh. right? How about this one? East Indians sometimes shake their head from side to side to show agreement with what is being said. That's true. Yeah. That's true. The Muslim religion forbids eating milk products with meat. Is it true or false? That's a Jewish thing. How about Muslim? I don't think so. In Japan, even the smallest token of as gifts are considered bribes. So when you give someone a little gift, would that be considered a bribe or not in Japan? I don't think so. How about this one? The euro is the currency of Switzerland. That's false. 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 Yeah. Um, so it is common in America to change your boss when you disagree, or to challenge your boss when you disagree. Is it? Or a knife is not an appropriate gift in Russia. These are hard. <laughs> well, but see, so this is what we were trying to do is more like what IQ does. You either know the answer or you don't. And mm -hmm. so there is a catalog of about a hundred questions, but so for the published version, we used 20. But for the online version, there is a catalog of about 150 questions at this time, and 20 would be randomly selected for you uh, to, to, you know, to answer. And so these are not easy to cheat because you either know the answer or you don't. And so that's, that's sort of our little contribution here. And that's the one that you talk, took. So you, we had the metacognitive, and then we had cognitive, then we had motivational and behavioral. So th those are the ones that you saw and so on and so on. So you have here more of those instruments uh, so you can look at them when you have time. So this is what we could find at this time. Some of them are actually commercial instruments and uh, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to share it. So what we did, I wanted to know what they are. I literally paid sometimes up to $50 to take the test. And then I was just literally taking, making copies because I wanted to know for myself what they do. And for two of those, I actually took the training to be the qualified, what they call coach. So I wanted to know not only how they measure, but also know the logic behind it, the training. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I found most of them to be, how should I put it politically correctly, not good. Meaning that almost all, not almost all, all of them rely on self-report, self-assessment. And so all of them are open to manipulation. And uh, I felt that they were just not very good. So there is one of the papers that I assigned to you, so it's still not published. We just submitted it, so hopefully it will be published soon. But this one uh, is literally half a century of measuring cross-cultural competence. So it's kind of similar to the other one that I wrote on measuring cultural values. And this one is the same thing, so 50 years of measuring cross-cultural competence. So in the paper, you will see kind of a historic overview, the review of the approaches, the review of the challenges, and things like that. So um, uh, it's in your reading list. Um, another paper that I put on your reading list, and this one was published last year, so I still don't have the volume number and the issue number because it just came out, I need to update it. But this one is sort of my own review of um, essentially the, the remaining challenges and remaining unanswered questions uh, of measuring CQ. So some of the questions like what Thad was talking about, what um, um, Amber raised, you know, I'm talking about some of those things. And so I want to spend some time talking about those things. So the paper gives you a more detailed overview. I just want to highlight some of the, you know, interesting concepts. And I will start with the description of this, what I call quasi-observational CQ. 
because this one is very different from all the other instruments. So I specifically developed it to be presumably better, but there are still some limitations, but at least it, it does take problem of the, uh, you know, takes care of the problem of challenges of self-assessment. So um, in the ideal world, if I wanted to measure somebody's cultural intelligence, I would like to observe that person in real life as that person maybe moves to another country and tries to adjust, or at the very least as that person interacts with people from other cultures, preferably several times. The problem is that it's not practically possible. Like if I wanted to assess Ember's uh, CQ for the job, I cannot, I do not have the time, I cannot, uh, follow her for a few months as she goes from one country to another and see how she's adjusting. That would be a good thing to do if I really wanted to know, but, but it, it, it's impossible. It's, it's it, not to mention that it probably would be unethical, like that would be creepy. But even, you know, if Amber said, oh, sure, you can, you know, buy me the first class ticket, send me to a few countries and then watch my behavior or give me a camera, I'll literally record myself. I mean, that's, that's way too expensive, it's impossible. So what is being done, as you saw, I ask Amber, so Amber, could you tell me how well you behave in these situations? But the problem with that is that sometimes Amber may not even be able to self-assess, but then also she knows what I want to hear. So she may give me, uh, you know, wrong, not wrong, but the answers that I want to hear, not the truth, but the, you know, the, the answers that I want to hear. And so what I tried to do here with this instrument is I decided to give you some sort of context and not ask to self-assess but to report your behaviors in those specific situations. And so the way it works is this. At the beginning of the test, I ask you what last three countries you visited. So think about a specific country or a couple of countries or three countries that you went to. Like for example, I don't know, Thad, what were the last few countries that you visited? Um, it's been a while since I've traveled, but I would just say the, uh the Caribbean islands and, and Argentina. Okay, how about you, Olivia? So what were the last couple of countries that you visited? Um, Argentina as well, actually, the Bahamas and Uruguay. Yeah, so you, you go to the same places almost, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then obviously some people, you know, who take the test may have not been to other countries. So there is a domestic version. So the first question is, have you ever traveled overseas? And if you choose yes, then it asks what were the last two, three countries that you visited. But then if you say no, then it tells you uh, what are the other people from, people from which countries did you talk to recently? So maybe some immigrants or maybe tourists, and you talk about that. So it is not part of the test for assessment, but it's to give you the context. So, you know, give you sort of, you know, the, to prime you to think about a specific interaction. And then it basically goes almost like the instrument that we took, but instead of asking how well do you do things, it asks you how did you actually do? Like, for example, a typical question for the preparation dimension would be, I spend a lot of time learning about cultures of other countries I'm about to visit. And then you say, you agree or disagree? So Thad, how would you answer that, you know, thinking about your trips to Argentina and the Caribbean islands? So did you, uh, you know, do you normally, sorry, in the normal context, forget about Argentina, forget about the islands. In general, do you spend a lot of time learning about other cultures of countries that you're about to visit? In general. Um, in general, I would say middle of the road to maybe a little bit, yes. So kind of three, maybe four. In my yeah. test, the question would be in the weeks prior to your trip to Argentina, to the Caribbean islands, how much time did you spend preparing and learning about cultures and traditions of these countries? And then your options are also not agree, disagree, but you say, well, I didn't really have time to prepare for these particular trips. I spent a few minutes, I spent about an hour, I spent many hours. So what would be your answer here? I would say about an hour, but it would probably be a little more than an hour. All right. So here, at least you have an objective way. Like if you're trying to be honest, you don't have to guess which one it is. So again, maybe in this case, you don't have a fine grained enough scale, but at least, you know, uh, you, you know exactly what the answer is. You know, that is definitely more than a few minutes, right? So then for example, the dimension that I call seeking. So again, uh, that's the motivation similar to motivation. So seeking opportunities um, and engaging in cross-cultural interactions. So the one that we took, the question was, I enjoy interacting with people from different cultures. And most of you said five strongly agree. So again, maybe you were trying to impress me. Maybe you, 
maybe you really strongly, you know, uh, uh, enjoy a lot interacting with people from other cultures. Well, here the instrument would be like, for example, Olivia. So when visiting those countries, Argentina, um, um, Uruguay, and uh, Bahamas, how many local people, new local people did you meet and befriend? Like ask for their name, what they do, what they like. And so what would be the number? So you have zero, one or two, maybe three or five or six or more. So how many locals did you meet on your trip? Well, so for Argentina, I actually lived there for two years. Uh -huh, so, okay. so then it would be a I lot. I guess that's, the, yeah, that's technically not a visit. But um, Bahamas was a vacation. And I would say three to five. Three or five. All right. So you have a specific number. And again, yeah. I would not be surprised that people say, I enjoy. But when they go, they basically stay in their Hilton or wherever it, it is and just yeah. talk to the staff. And even then probably don't really ask them, you know, so what do you, you know, do, do you have a family? How do you spend your time? So this one is a little bit more, I call it quasi observational because it's not a true observation of the person, but at least you kind of, you try to observe your own behavior in the past and report it. Adaptation. Again, we had a typical question. I changed my nonverbal behavior when a, cross, when, when a cross cultural situation requires it. And this one is difficult. I mean, do we really change it? Do we even know that we need to change? Maybe we think that we change. So here it's more like when, when, when visiting those countries, as you were interacting with the locals, did you adjust your communication style? And so in this specific case, you know, like, no, I was just speaking English the way I normally do. Uh, so no, there was no need, or I spoke slower, or maybe I adjusted my speed, tone, and gestures, or maybe I completely changed my interaction style. And so this one, again, gives you a more specific sort of, you know, um, uh, objective evaluation. Is it good or bad? Well, that's a different question, but you know, there you have that. Um, ability to spot cultural differences, uh, learning basically. Again, the usual question is, as I interact with people from different cultures, I try to learn about different, about their cultures. So in my instrument, it's more, if you had to write down the new things you learned about those cultures, how much can you write down? So basically, how much did you learn? So for example, I don't know, um, um, uh, Olivia, when you went to Bahamas, so how much can you tell about Bahamian culture now? So a few sentences, one page, several pages, or you can learn a whole, write a whole book about it. So what would you put? Uh, I would say a few sentences. A few sentences. So again, some people say, well, oh, I learned a lot. But here yeah. there is a more specific. And again, like I've been, for example, to Cozumel. So I've been to Mexico a few times, but Cozumel kind of is the closest to the ones that you named. And yes, I did attend, uh, you know, visit those uh, uh, Incas temples. But did I really learn much about the culture? maybe a few sentences, maybe up to a page, but definitely not more. So even though I was kind of trying to engage in the culture and interactions. Um, culture shock, uh, so ability to adapt. Somebody said that maybe it's our ability. So a typical question, I'm sure I can deal with the stresses of working with people from other cultures. Well, here again, so when visiting those cultures, there were, the, uh, were there moments when you missed your home and wanted to go back, to leave back? Again, oh, all the time I wanted to go back to America as soon as possible, or maybe never. No, I never felt like that. I actually enjoyed it very much. Or maybe, you know, a couple of times or maybe only once. So it gives you a little bit more. And the knowledge, just like the ones I showed you, so there are a catalog, and so you kind of select the correct answer. Like, for example, four is considered a lucky number in China. True or false? Anyone knows? So is four a lucky number in China or not? Anyone? No, it's the same sound as for the word death. And so four is a very unlucky number. Like you don't have the fourth floor on the, uh, you know, in the skyscrapers. Nobody wants to have a four in there. You know, it's like, like 13 in the United States, but probably even more, you know, even more serious. So I also tried the, the dimension called denial. Uh, so kind of cultural awareness. So again, a typical question would be, do you think cultural differences are not important because in fact, uh, because of the fact that in the end uh, of the day, all people are, have the same interests um, and goals in life. And so um, I tried that and it didn't, didn't fit very well with the rest of the instrument. So eventually I dropped it. So maybe because that's a fundamentally attitudinal variable unlike the other ones. And so it didn't work, didn't fit very well with the instrument. Uh, but yeah, so those were the factors, the five factors. And so I'm not sure if you know much about statistics, but it's a, what we call a very good factor structure. So each of the items correlate with the items within that block and not with other blocks. And so all of these numbers were very good. So I was very happy to see these results. Um, there was another instrument that I really liked and unfortunately it's been discontinued. 
So there is a guy, uh, it's a whole team, but David Thomas is the leader of that team in Canada at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And so the instrument they developed was um, essentially a series of videos that show you different cross-cultural interactions. So like each video is maybe like five minutes long, maybe four minutes long, and you watch the video. And so there would be all kinds of like a business meeting, for example, people from different cultures, or maybe a person you know, is invited to somebody's home from a different culture, and you kind of watch the video, what's happening in, in that situation. And then the questions would be about that, um, you know, that video. So there would be like, for example, so why was John upset? Or why would Muhammad uh, be so happy to hear it? Or what Sarah did wrong when she was meeting with, uh, I don't know, Toshio Ozaki. And so if you know about those cultures, if you know what's going on in that situation, if you know what those cultures are, you spot right away, oh, he should have not been talking like that to, you know, like in Japan, John should have not been calling his boss by the first name. So uh, you know that, or maybe you don't know and you're like, I have no idea, or, you know, you just choose your own answer. And so the problem with that instrument was that it was very difficult to administer. So unlike the one that we took, like in 10 minutes, we can complete the whole test. Here you have to watch many videos and it takes, I don't, I don't know how much, I don't remember how much it was, but it was definitely more than an hour. Like it's a long test. And then they used open-ended questions to describe the situations. And so then they had to use graduate students to score the test. So it's not just, you know, click, 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 and you got the result. It took a, long, a lo lot of time. And apparently it didn't correlate or didn't predict many things very well, because again, it looked primarily at the knowledge and not so much at what would you do and so as a result, uh, it only assessed one narrow dimension of cultural intelligence. So it's cheaper just to simply ask those kind of true and false questions. You either know or you don't, than to go through this whole hassle. And so sadly, at some point, they decided not to offer that instrument anymore. Um, another instrument that we developed, and I showed it to you, so this BCIQ. So it's kind of similar to, and at all, the only difference that I didn't highlight there is that in, in the instrument by N and many others, um, that the kind of the statements are very general and in many cases designed for students. And so some of the situations, some of the, um, you know, um, attitudes kind of deal with the classroom. And so if I wanted to use that instrument for, uh, like, let's say, for example, uh, employment needs, many questions sort of wouldn't make sense because it's about classroom, the classroom environment and not business environment. So what we did was, as you saw, it's a similar instrument, but the, the way the questions are phrased, they're a little bit more about the con context that an expatriate is more likely to encounter. And so we specifically tried to make it a little bit more relevant for business. And so it's actually quite popular now uh, among the, you know, like for employment, for promotions, for international assignments and things like that. Um, another big question is, so going back to what is CQ, is that in many cases, people cannot really explain if it's some sort of an innate train, trait. You know, is it something that is deep, deep, deep in our head? And when we change that behavior or when we change how we talk, maybe just simply a reflection of that internal something that we cannot observe directly, but only through these behavioral changes or maybe, you know, the way we, we you know, like study and learn about other cultures. But others say, well, maybe CQ is not really something deep inside our brain, but it is a collection of those behaviors. Maybe it doesn't matter if you enjoy interacting with people from other cultures, as long as you know how and you adjust your behavior, maybe you are culturally intelligent. So it's not something that must be kind of emanating from, from, from the inside, but it's you learning what needs to be done and doing it. So maybe it's more about you know, a collection of specific actions and attitudes as opposed to something that is deep inside that then manifests, manifests through those actions. So, and then the, obviously then the question becomes, so can it be learned? Can it be taught? So if it is like an innate trait, then you can't really learn it. Like IQ, for example, uh, they say that some of that can be trained, but ultimately IQ is something that you're sort of born with. So it's almost genetic, or at least a good portion of that is genes. So you either have a powerful brain and you can solve those riddles or you don't. Uh, but some believe that maybe CQ is different. Maybe CQ, it's not something that you're born with, but it's something that you can improve through training. You know, you, you sit down and you read about those cultures and you know how to greet people, and you know how to talk and you know how to interact with them. And so the question is, that, does it make you then culturally intelligent 
or is it simply you learn some skills? And so that's a kind of fundamental question that we still don't know the answer to. So and we haven't been studying it long enough to see, for example, if it's something that is passed from parents to children, because the way to test that would be, you know, if you have like uh, siblings, you know, or maybe uh, twins, and one of them always travels around the world and the other one never travels around the world. And so would the one who travels be more culturally intelligent? If so, then it may be something that you just simply learn through experience. But if the CQ will still be the same for both of them, maybe we will say, well, it doesn't really matter what you do, you either kind of have it or you don't. So that's a you know, challenge. Um, then there are a couple of papers that I assigned that other people talk about, you know, cultural intelligence, what it is, uh, as uh, Christopher Early calls it, uh, the elusive cultural chameleon. So basically, you know, uh, something that we kind of know what it is, but always have a difficult time explaining what it is and then measuring it. Um, and so, and then there are a couple of other papers that sort of talk about the concept of CQ, how to make, like this one is very, you know, methodologically complicated and you don't need to understand all the math, but it gives you some idea as to how people approach it. And it's, it's a, you know, as I said, a very scientific approach. So just like with C, uh, IQ, there are a lot of mathematical models, a lot of testing, a lot of validation. So there are ways, you know, to do it sort of right. And so many people, uh, many scientists do it. Um, and finally, consequences of CQ. So does it predict anything? Let me ask you this question. So do you think CQ predicts anything? Do you think it would be advisable to um, use CQ as a selection test? I do, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I'll show you a couple of studies of my own where I actually did test it. And then um, there will be um, a few assigned studies by others that did it. So for one of the studies, we did a meta-analysis. Uh, do you know what meta-analysis is? Um, I'll explain because this will be coming up all the time in all the courses you will be assigned meta-analysis. Um, imagine that you want to test the relationship between education and income. How would you test it? So you want to know if more education means higher income. How would you test it? You'd have to look at all the other things that have been done previously maybe correlate them. Like so let's say, Tessa, I hire you and I pay you, I don't know, $20,000. I want to know if education improves income. So I, I'm considering if I should send my kids to school or not. And I know it's very expensive. And so uh, I want to know if those extra years of education will mean that they will make more money. So here is the money. Go find the answer. How would you, how would you answer that question? And I want to have a hard number, you know, not just your thoughts, but an actual empirical test of this question? Um, I'd have to do a statistical analysis and I would have to uh, take the existing information and try and uh, correlate two sets of information to make... So what would be the things that you would be correlating? Well, you'd have to know what the income levels were and you'd have to compare that with a range of educational um, levels, I guess, and try and build from the two sets of information to see if there's a correlation between the variance in both, both sets of data. So what you would do essentially, you're saying that you would sort of walk outside, catch 10 people and ask them, so how many years of education do you have? And then how much do you make? And you ask that of each of the 10 people in your sample, and then you will do the correlation to see if those who have more uh, years of education make more money, right? Or maybe catch them before they go to college and then wait for five years and then catch them again and say, so how much did you make before? How much do you make after? And yeah. then see if there is an improvement. Something like that, right? Or maybe get access to some sort of an archival, you know, like census data. And then there would be whatever number of people there and you will look at, uh, education level and income and then see if there is a correlation, right? So, so now let's imagine that I don't have the time to wait for you to go and ask all those people around and, you know, uh, and maybe they will not even want to tell you the answers. And so we don't know. So another way to do it is to conduct what we call a meta-analysis. Maybe somebody already did it. And so Tesla goes to Google Scholar and she types income and education. And there are like 50 studies that come up. Probably there will be many more. There will be probably 200 studies that will come up. Uh, on, on the relationship between income and education. And so Tessa looks at it, uh, 
and then all of a sudden the problem is that each study gives me a different you know like income and education so and there are a total of four million studies well some of them are not empirical but let's say we found a hundred good studies that already tested that and so those people already went outside and caught 10 people each of those scholars and asked them for the income and education and so they wanted to see what others already did and so the easiest way to do a meta-analysis would be to find 10 existing studies and see like for example eight of them said that there is a positive correlation and two maybe said that there is no correlation so based on that we will say well 80 percent of the studies have shown that there is a positive effect or maybe you will find those 10 studies and you will say that uh, you know, one of them found the correlation of 0.5, another one found correlation of 0.4, another one found a correlation of 0.6. You take the average and you say the average correlation reported in the meta-analysis was 0.5. Or maybe, you know, if they look at, for example, uh, by how much uh, the income increases for every year of education, again, some of them gave you, you know, by 3,000, others said by 5,000. So you take the average. Now, the challenge obviously is that some of those meta-analysis may have been looking at the improvement in hourly wage and others in the improvement in annual salary. So you will have to put that on the same scale. So you will convert it to some, you know, let's say annual income. And maybe some of them were looking at the years of education and others were looking at the highest degree attained. Again, you would convert like bachelor's to, you know, 16 years of education and put it on the same scale. And that's precisely what we did with uh, cultural intelligence. So we found a total of about 60 papers. Um, let me share that again. So we found about 60 papers that looked at um, uh, the effects of cultural intelligence on, on, on all kinds of things. And so essentially we you know, looked at the correlations. And so here you have a lot of numbers, but essentially we were looking at cultural intelligence and its effect on general adjustment to new cultures, interactional adjustment and work adjustment. So when people go overseas, uh, are they easily adjusted to that new environment? And then at the interpersonal level and specifically for work. And you see here a lot of different things, but one point that I would like to highlight is that not only did we look at cultural intelligence, but we also looked at all kinds of other things. Like for example, we looked at IQ, general mental ability. We looked at emotional intelligence. We looked at personality, the big five, agree agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, openness to experience, but also we looked at emotional stability, language proficiency, international prior experience, and so as you can see, the correlations were 0 0.14, 0 0.26, 0 0.14. So in all cases, it's a positive significant correlation. And when you compare that to other things, well, it's much better than, for example, IQ. So it's definitely much higher than general cognitive ability, which almost had no correlation, like literally virtually no correlation. But for example, it's not as good as emotional intelligence. So it seems like it's not so much about cultural, but it's about emotional intelligence that predicts your adjustment. So the conclusion can be here that it's good, better than most, but not perfect. So here is a simplified model where you have essentially the correlation. So this R bar, that's the correlation. So when you look at the, um, at the correlation with adjustment in this case, uh, so you would have uh, emotional intelligence, the best predictor, then some personality things. But then when you look at the CQ, it's 0.19. So it's respectable better than most, like for example, even better than prior international experience, but not as good as some traits of personality or emotional intelligence. So I would use it, but do not expect it to explain everything. So it explains something, but not everything. And then another study I did, it was based on this Exculture project. So we had, um, for this particular paper, I think we looked like 40,000 people, and we looked at what predicts um, performance on the task. So basically the quality of the work that people produce, how good is the report that they write? How good is the advertisement ideas or strategy that they develop as a team? And then we also looked at psychological outcomes. So basically how well people get along with one another, how well they like each other, how much they liked the task. And so we looked at all kinds of things that predicted performance and interpersonal dynamics. But one of them was cultural intelligence. And so as you can see, the correlation was positive and significant. Uh, so it does predict how well you do the work. In a, and importantly, it was in teams where there were seven people per team, each one from a different country. So essentially that's the ability of work, you know, to work with people from other cultures. And so when the cultural intelligence of the team was higher, then the quality of the product they produced was better. And then even more so they liked each other better. So when you have high cultural intelligence, it seems like you will do much better. 
So it does matter. But then when you look at other things, like for example, technical skills were even more important. In fact, technical skills, you know, technical skills like knowing how to use Zoom, knowing how to use Dropbox, knowing how to use Google, Skype, you know, all those things actually was even more important than cultural intelligence. So technical expertise was even more important than also knowing, knowing the working language, basically proficiency in English. Again, it was even more important than cultural intelligence, which kind of makes sense. The language of the interaction was English. And if you're not fluent in it, obviously it will be a problem. But just about anything else uh, was weaker. So it's not as good as some things, but it's better than most. So I'd say, yeah, maybe use it. Use it because it seems to predict a lot of things and uh, better than many things. So, um, yeah. And uh, that's where I'm going to stop. So we are pretty much over time now. Uh, any comments, any questions, any concerns, any observations? What do you think about this whole CQ stuff? Yes, go ahead, Tessa. Um, is there any difference in how good people are in terms of their cultural awareness or, or their ability to do this kind of stuff, the further they are apart in cultural distance. So are culturally distant people less likely to be successful than those that are more closely related? This is an excellent question. We talked a little bit about it last time when we talked that sometimes maybe not knowing each other well helps because you don't have the stereotypes. But uh, it's a good question because is cultural intelligence country specific? You know, can you be culturally intelligent when you interact with, for example, people from Mexico? Because here in the United States, we are close and we interact a lot. But maybe you're completely culturally dumb. I'm not sure what would be the opposite, culturally intelligent, culturally, yeah, I guess, you know, not intelligent. When you interact maybe with, I don't know, Ukrainians or the Japanese. So uh, I don't know. That's a very, very good question. And does it matter the distance? You know, is it because, you know, are you good with, let's say, Mexicans because it's close and you know them and bad with the Japanese because you don't? Or can it be the opposite? Maybe some people have some stereotypes about, I don't know, Latin American cultures. And even though they know them, they're terrible at it because they, they have the stereotypes and they treat them you know, wrong. And maybe when they look at some New Zealanders or, or Koreans, they have no idea who those are. So they're kind of more curious and less prejudiced and maybe they will actually perform better. So that's an, that would be actually an interesting study. I've never seen a study like that. So if you ever want to do, you know, like write a research paper, that, that would be a very, very good question. So that's, a, in fact, now that you gave me the idea, maybe we should write a paper together. So that, that's a good one. So, yeah, and, and we have enough data in Exculture. So we do know how well, how much they know about different cultures because we have those knowledge questions. So first we can look at them, the neighbors, like we can literally assess the neighborhood. But then once we know that, you know, how far they are from each other and how much they know about each other, we can then see if, uh, if you know, if that distance matters and if the cultural intelligence level moderates that relationship. Actually, that, that's a good idea. So we should give it a try maybe or, uh, I don't know, uh, at least share that idea maybe with the PhD students in our program. Maybe somebody will want to make a dissertation out of it. That's a good question. Yeah. Any other comments? All right, well then read the papers. Um, as I said, some of them are a little bit more mathematical and uh, don't worry about understanding the math. It's more to give you an idea how these things are studied, uh, you know, kind of general approach. But again, if you're mathematically inclined, why not, you know, read the whole thing. But uh, pay special attention to those review papers, you know, where we talk about, you know, how it's been done, what are the problems. So those are much easier to understand and, uh, you know, much more appropriate sort of uh, for the type of course that we're teaching here. It's not a methods course, it's a management course. So it gives you a much more kind of how to stuff. All right, well, thank you so much. So let's stop here and then I'll see you next week uh, for another lecture and um, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys.